Hey, man, good morning, church. Well, it's been quite a day. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's get on into God's Word here. Well, today we continue our study on prayer. I'm actually very excited about today's lesson. I think it's going to be uh, something that I hope will help you out tremendously in your relationship with God. Can someone bring me a, a, a rag? Someone spilled grape juice all over the podium here. Amen. Well, last week we started out uh, with the whole part of the Lord's Prayer, uh, Father, hallowed be your name. Uh, today we're going to cover the second part of the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come. Be turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Like we learned last week, it takes a proper prayer life to fight the right fight. You know, every day Satan comes after you. And how does he come after you? To fight him? No. Satan wants to get us to fight each other. He wants to get us angry with each other. He wants us to get angry with the wrong things and fight the wrong battles. And your prayer life is what's going to save you from that. Prayer is the barometer of your life and your faith. So go your prayers, so goes your life. And today, the second part of the prayer... um, could potentially be the longest part of your prayer if you really do understand what the scriptures teach about prayer. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Can be inspiring or scary, whichever you choose. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life. Only a few find it. I put before you this morning that only a few find it because only a few pray the way the Bible calls them to. Let's go to our scripture in uh, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. A funny little story about this young girl. This young girl was standing on the street corner, preaching about God to whoever would listen to her. A businessman stopped by and began to listen, and finally he interrupted her in her tracks and said, Excuse me, are you trying to tell me that everything in the Bible is true? And the little girl looked at him and said, Why, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. He says, Okay, so you're telling me that the story of Jonah and the big fish is true. And she says, it is absolutely true, because it's in the Bible. The man said, okay, well, tell me then how Jonah could survive in the belly of a fish for three entire days. And the little girl thought for a moment, and she said, well, I don't completely understand how, but when I get to heaven, I'll ask. And then he said, but what if Jonah went to hell? And she said, then you can ask him. Certainly, that's not exactly how we want to present God's Word, but (laughs) amen for deep convictions. Let's begin reading in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. The Lord's Prayer. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father... Hallowed be your name. Hopefully you learned how to pray that that part of the prayer a whole lot better last week. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. That's usually the bulk of our prayer right there, isn't it? Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. You know, prayerfully you have... uh, come today, having prayed that prayer, having forgiven anyone who's ever sinned against you. He says, and lead us not into temptation. 
What a prayer. That was one for the ages. And yet, it is probably one of the most misunderstood passages in the Bible. People just reiterate it over and over and over. Millions. And yet, this part of the prayer is essential. Last week, we learned to talk to God as our Father. Yeah. To talk to Him about how powerful He is. And certainly, He's not a vain God. He doesn't want you to tell Him how powerful He is just for His ego. He wants you to understand who He is so that you can pray the rest of the prayer knowing His power and what He's capable of. And then we come to the second part of the prayer that we're going to cover today. Your kingdom come. It is essential that you understand the kingdom to pray for the kingdom to come. You know, there's some interesting dynamics in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus served everyone. And yet he focused his teaching on true worshipers. He taught the people in parables and they were confused because they were uncommitted. And yet he did that to weed out false worshipers. And then he taught very explicitly those who were committed to him fully. You know, the topic that he taught on the longest, though, was the teaching about the kingdom. Jesus spent his last 40 days on this earth teaching only about the kingdom to his disciples. And I've just got to ask, if, if Jesus saw fit to spend the last 40 days of his life here on earth teaching about the kingdom, how much should we be praying about the kingdom and his coming of that kingdom in our prayers each day? With all these things in mind, there's four things that I'd like us to talk about today. Um, and the title of today's lesson is Bring It On. Bring it on. Our first point, Matthew 6, verse 33, bring the church. Matthew 6, verse 33, bring the church. Most of you don't need to turn there. You know the scripture. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We understand that the church began in 33 A.D., that was when it first came on this earth that it was prophesied about. And yet, I want to explain some things about the church. Amen? Can I do that this morning? You know, we meet in this building every week. And it's a beautiful Seventh-day Adventist church. Millions of dollars spent to put this thing together. And yet the church is not a building. It's just not. It's not a place. The church is the souls of saved men and women. And that's it. When God looks down from heaven, he doesn't see a Seventh-day Adventist church. He doesn't see a Baptist church. He doesn't see the Catholic church. He doesn't see ICOC, ICC, all this stuff that we hear about. God looks down and sees saved men and women. Amen. And yet, when you became a true disciple of Jesus know that everybody quite grasped the gravity of it. When you made Jesus Lord of your life, when you became a part of the church, you didn't just become a part of something, you became the church. It's not, oh, well, this church or, or that church. There's only the church. But that changes everything. Does not. I hear the phrase all the time. Well, in this church, no, there's only the church, and it's you. Oh, the church is unloving. Okay, well then stop being unloving, because it's you. The church demands too much. Well, then stop being so demanding. See, if I choose my words a little carefully, cowards talk that way. Cowards who are not fit enough to just say, you know what, I have an attitude with this brother. We got to call it the church. We got to label it the church so I don't have to actually go forgive that brother. And yet, we've got to get off of grouping people, labeling people, and treat every individual as an individual based on their personal contact and our individual interaction with that individual. Amen? 
But yet, if you are the church, now you're praying to bring the church. What does that mean? That means more of you. See, to pray about bringing the church, your kingdom come, is to pray that you multiply. You being fruitful. Well, you know, you have to bear the fruit of the Spirit to bear the fruits of disciples. You ever seen an angry person bring somebody to church? Somebody who's just down and... Uh, and then, oh, I got my visitor right here with me. I got my friend with me. It just doesn't happen. No. And, and yet, consider the piece of bring the church with multiplication. Um, if everyone in the church were just like me, what kind of church is this going to be? If we multiply you over and over and over and over again, what kind of church are we going to have? Because you're supposed to be praying about that every morning in the Lord's Prayer. Is your kingdom come? Make more of me, just like me, because I'm striving to be just like you with all my heart. See, some of our biggest problems in our lives begin when we stop seeking the kingdom first. Why do you think it's the second part of the prayer? God, His kingdom. That's the priorities of life for a disciple of Jesus. But see, we stop seeking physically the events of church or discipling times with church or Bible talk with church or whatever we want to call it, answering phone calls with other people that are in the church. See, we start doing that when we stop praying this part of the prayer. That's really where it begins. It always begins there. And it's because of a perspective and a focus. I have to confess, I'm a, I'm a Trekkie. I love Star Trek. And I love the third Star Trek movie from a long time ago before many of you were born. And Spock gives up his life to save the ship. And he has a famous line that I love. That the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. And uh, I've just got to wonder if that is our focus today. That the collective needs of God's kingdom are greater than my own individual needs. That is the spirit that Jesus brought. Do you remember Luke 14, 25? When we became disciples, we counted the cost yeah. of if we were going to do this for the rest of our life with the understanding of if I didn't. So do you remember in that passage that we ask for terms of peace? And yet I, I hear and see so much of, well, I ain't going to do that. What are you talking about? I don't need to talk to you. Go talk to somebody else. I, I, I hear those kind of attitudes and things, and I wonder, have you asked for terms of peace to Jesus? That it's okay to shun a brother or a sister. That it's okay to refuse to meet with another disciple. You know, our prayers are to be filled with a pleading and a begging for God's wisdom and discernment so we can understand how to advance His church. And by the way, it's His church, not yours or mine. <laughs> We just got to kind of got to kind of remember that, you know. But we're supposed to be praying through all the things that we have in our heart and our life that stop us from duplicating ourselves. Let's not even call it evangelism. Let's just call it what it's supposed to be. We're supposed to bear fruit. A tree that doesn't bear fruit is what? Dead. The only trees that don't bear fruit are dead trees or ones dying. And, okay, we're not going to make a disciple every week. We're not gonna, maybe not every month. But we're supposed to be vibrant and bearing the fruits of the Spirit on a regular basis. And you cannot bear the fruits of the Spirit if you're not seeking first God's kingdom because that's His plan for having a great spirit. You know, when we said Jesus was Lord, we said that we would submit to all authorities. You know what that means? That means we, we actually drive the speed limit, you know? We don't get speeding tickets anymore because we submit to the authorities. But we also, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting thing to me, though, um, how we carry hurts 
I got burned. So I'm not going that route anymore. You know, I think many of us have an easier time submitting to the worldly authorities than the godly authorities. And, uh, yeah, I mean, God has a plan for his church, right? Can we all agree on that, that there's a plan that God has for his church? And he gives it to his leaders. He does. We, we can like it or not like it. Um, I didn't ask to be the leader. God called me, okay. Uh, I was content being AJ, you know, being the sound guy for 23 years. But that's not the way it turned out. And I have to preach his plan, not mine, not yours. The one that's in the scriptures. And yet, will you trust God's word? Or will you go, that's an authority figure. I got burned by one, so I'm not going to follow. I mean, Jeremiah 29 is clear. God has a plan. You know what? I'm going to make mistakes as the leader. And hopefully I'll be the first one to just go, dude, I blew it. I'm sorry. Because I'm not out for my glory. I have no ambitions except for God to be glorified. But I know, Jeremiah 29, that plan is not our plan. God's plan for you to have a hope in a future doesn't look like what you think it looks like. It looks like something else that will come through the mouth of another man or woman. Because that's how God's always worked. And it's not my plan either. I know that. We're carried along by the Spirit. But we don't pray for another plan. We pray for God's plan and to understand it. Consider our brothers and sisters in the first century. When the plan called for them to give up jobs or money or move or whatever, you don't see any hesitating in the scriptures. The only hesitating you saw was the couple that held back some of their money and, got, and God killed them for it. I don't understand why he did that. I, I, just, I just know I don't want to do that. That's all I know about it. You know? I know I don't want to make you feel guilty and put it out there as like a guilt trip to you, I, but it's in the scriptures for a reason. It's got to be talked about. Yet the thing, the one that gets me as a father is when the plan called for them to die or deny the faith, they chose death. When the plan called for them to stand by and watch their children ripped in half, literally, and be fed the lions. It's my brothers and sisters' kids. They didn't even flinch. You know why? Because they learned this prayer from Jesus, and they prayed it every day. That's what he taught them, and that's what they did. That's why they did not waver. It's, wow. We're so scared of being hurt. We're so afraid of people. It's disgusting how afraid we get. To be afraid is to say, I don't trust you. I don't trust your plan. I'm too good to be hurt or die. I'm better than Jesus. It was okay for him to do it for me, but it's not okay for me to do it for somebody. We've got to stop struggling through what it takes. The real work it takes to really build the church so that we can really pray, God, your kingdom come. Yeah. The more the church advances, the more people will be in heaven with us. And that makes it worth it. So let's bring on the church. Yeah. Secondly, Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 10. Our second point, bring on the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. 
Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. You know, 30 times in the Bible, the Armageddon is referred to as the day of the Lord. And we've got to understand that what we read about in the coming of the kingdom study was just the beginning. There's another day coming where the heavenly kingdom will be revealed. And we're to pray for that every day. Peter called that day, check this out, it gets a little quiet when you talk about that. And yet, Peter called that day a great and glorious day. That's someone who's confident of where they're at with God. See, you're supposed to actually pray to speed the day of Jesus coming. The day your Lord and Savior will return for you. We often say, you know, just take me away. I just want it to all end. Well, then pray for that. Because he will come. You got to pray for the heavenly kingdom to come every single day. I mean, it's heaven, guys. It's like, yes! But yet you're quiet because that's not really what you're thinking about all the time. That's not really what you're focused on all the time. And that's not really what fires you up like it should. And today we've got to make decisions that that is what fires us up, is being in heaven with our God. Amen. See, these prayers are supposed to produce something in you. They're supposed to produce an understanding of Jesus, who he is, and what he's going to do. Man, I hope you're ready to stand before him today. But if you're not, it's just a couple of decisions away. Pray for the return of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bring on that day. Thirdly, go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Y'all didn't know it was going to be like that, huh? John chapter 12, verse 48. You're like, yeah, the kingdom, woo! Awesome. John 14, John 12, verse 48. Our third point, boy, you better be able to say this one. Bring on eternal judgment. Bring it on. Verse 48. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him in the last day. Woo! Getting hot. <laughs> okay, I just got a simple question for you, right? I already know the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway for effect. Do you like being judged? Yeah. Why not? Why don't you like being judged? You got something to hide? You're not going to me measure up to the judgment? I mean, what's the problem? Somebody hurt you? It's a funny thing. I'm just I'm being a little facetious, but... We spend so much time thinking about people judging us that we f actually forget about God judging us. We really do. And it actually robs us of the time that we need to prepare ourselves to be ready for Him. Now, here's the funny thing. You don't like it when, when I look at you and judge you. Start poking in your life, see what's going on, Michael. You know? Michael actually liked it, though. He repented, too. It was awesome. But you know what? It actually doesn't matter one bit if you like God judging you or not. It doesn't matter if you like how he does it, what scriptures he's going to use, how he's going to handle it, the tone of his voice when he says it. It really doesn't matter one bit how you feel about it. You're either going to get on board with it now or you're just going to like it then. And, I mean, you think about it. I mean, there's that famous saying, you'll get on fire now or you'll get on fire later. I mean, that's just truth. And I don't say it to scare you because you should want to be with God. You should be inspired by being with God. 
And it shouldn't like shake you up to hear God's going to judge you. Right. If you're living with all of your heart and praying like this every day. Amen. I mean, but did you really realize that when you pray to speed the day of his return, you're actually praying, judge me sooner? That's really what you're saying, in effect. And man, if you're constantly praying that prayer every day, how different are you really going to live? But that's why we lose our fear of God, because we stop praying about it. We stop praying about God's judgment, so we stop fearing it. I mean, I mean, you think about it. The whole world standing in line to be judged. I mean, that, that's going to be like... Oh, no, no, go right ahead. Yeah, you can all cut. I'll go. I, I'm, I'm just being a gentleman. Go right on in. <laughs> There's not going to be anybody angry about, oh, who cut in line in front of me today? You know? It's funny, you know, you get in line at the store and, and you got like one item and you got an attitude with the person in front of you, like, can you just let me go? And you know, it's funny because when you pray like this every day, it's what, this is what it produces. This is what, I have people all the time, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm taking so long. I go, oh, don't worry about it. I'm not important at all. I'm just a man. We think, of our, we think so importantly of ourselves that people are scared, like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm wasting your time. And yet on that day, oh, no, no, go right ahead, go right ahead. No problem, I'm not, I'm, no, I'm just here. <laughs> now here's the, cra here's the crazy thing. So there's actually two lines. So there's your regular line of judgment. Uh, which most of you will end up in. And then there's the line for the ministers, the teachers. They're actually in the other line. It's more judgment. I mean, I, I do want you guys to understand, as I've taken over the region here, that when I speak, you have to understand, when I speak to you, I know I'm in that other line. I know I'm held more accountable for what I teach and what I say, and I take that very seriously. So if I tell you something, it's because I believe with all my heart that it's going to help you get to heaven, and that's the only reason. It's not to manipulate you. It's not to get you to do anything. It's not some special agenda that I have. It's simply I want you in heaven too, and I want to pass judgment. <laughs> But, you know, you think about judgment, that fires me up, but it is so scary at the same time. We talk about the need to be careful with different things. This is where we need to talk about being careful. Being careful of what we individually say before the Lord. It's not walking on eggshells, trying to appease people. It's trying to make sure that I'm right before the Lord in what I say and do. And it gives me great comfort to know that true disciples are a royal priesthood that are under the new covenant and that you're all teachers of God's word. So there's an increased judgment on all of us knowing the truth when we go to heaven and what we do with that truth and how we live each day. Turn to Psalm 103. A couple of scriptures that really help me with perspective when we talk about eternal judgment and God's heavenly kingdom. Psalm 103, verse 10. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Go to Luke 21, verse 36. Luke 21, verse 36. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. This morning, pray to be prepared to tell God, bring on my judgment. On. Lastly, John 14, verse 1 and 2, bring on my best friend. Oh. Verse 1 and 2. Bring on my best friend. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. 
Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. I know the way to the place where I am going. Woo! Man, that's going to be awesome. It's going to be incredible. What thing about God do you want to know that no one can answer right now? What will you ask Jesus? What conversation will you have with Moses, with the prophets, with all those who gave their lives so that you could be here now and have the truth? What will you ask Isaiah, who was sawed in two between the altar and the temple? What will you ask those brothers and sisters who gave up their kids for me and you? so that we would have that heart here and now with our kids' time, with their lives. Man, when I get a break from this life, no more broken knees, no more broken necks, no more migraine headaches, wow, no more people's problems, no more baby mama drama, no more violence, just Jesus. Just Jesus. We think we like him, but man, if we had to walk with him, I think many of us wouldn't really like Jesus. Because he was deep. He was hard lined, like you can't even imagine. But man, he loved deep. Man, he inspired. Man, anything is possible. And yes, he knew the way to where we all need to go. Yeah. I'll tell you what I'm going to do when I get there. <laughs> I love drag racing, but that's nothing between now and heaven. Man, I'm going to go mock five with my hair on fire. I'm going to fly. I'm going to be buzzing around. Yeah! Come on, baby! Oh! It's going to be hot! Yes! <laughs> I can't wait to fly I have so many questions and yet I can't wait to be with my brother Jesus my savior he's my lord even though I call you guys here and there he's the one I turn to really He's the only one that never turns me away. That always thinks of me first. He's the one I ask advice on for everything. He's the example I always look to. I hope that's how you view your brother. You know, I want you to consider Revelation chapters 21 and 22 as we close out. Heaven is going to be... 1,400 miles long. The wall's 200 feet thick. That's a pretty safe place. Ain't nobody breaking into there. The wall's made of jasper and sapphire. I mean, you think of the streets paved with pure gold like glass. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be incredible. Only a few are going to find it. Because only a few are going to pray, your kingdom come every day. Only a few are going to keep their hearts focused on Jesus. This morning, let us learn and grow in how to pray, your kingdom come. Let us pray for the advancement of our church here on earth. Let us pray for the return of our King, Jesus. Let us pray to speed the coming of that day so that we can hang out with our best friend. Today, let us be ready so that we can pray, God, bring it on. Next week, next time we're together, give us each day our daily bread. I love you guys.